Sorry about that, as I come stumbling in. Hey everyone, welcome to Professor Long's Lectures in Microbiology. I'm Professor Bob Long. Um, the purpose of these videos is they are intended for use by students who are enrolled in my course, Microbiology 2420, or Microbiology for the uh, Biology 2420, or Microbiology for the Allied Health Sciences. Now, um, I want the students who are in my class watching these videos and learning this material. This is how we're delivering the, the lectures during uh, the COVID shutdown. If anyone else out there in YouTube land finds these helpful, um, please hit like, um, subscribe, and or shoot me some information, make some comments, or shoot me some feedback so that I know to keep doing these. All of these videos are done rather crudely. It's a cell phone and a tripod, me and a marker board, and that's it. There's no fancy editing. I do all of these in one take, okay? So please bear with me if there's mistakes or ums or hums or pauses or mispronunciations. If I misspell something on the board, you know, it's just the way it goes. Now, um, we have been covering chemistry up to this point. We've been doing the chemistry chapter. We went over what are elements, um, what are atoms, the electron diagram of some of the more simple atoms, what is an ion, how to predict if an atom will ionize, we went over ionic bonds, covalent bonds, and hydrogen bonds, and a little bit about water and, pol and its polarity. Um, what we're going to do now is we're going to go over, oh, and we also went over acids and bases and the pH scale, all of which is important. You need to prepare that uh, for, for an exam on that stuff. Now, the last part of chemistry that we need to cover is called uh, the, the four major organic compounds of uh, living organisms. So. Uh, Again, what I'm doing is sort of a brief or abbreviated um, short version of what you need to know based on what I think is important for the rest of this class. We may add some more chemistry later on. So I'm giving a brief, broad overview. You should have had chemistry before you take microbiology, um, but I want to go over those concepts that are going to be important for this semester. So now, <clears throat> when we talk about chemistry, and this isn't necessarily in the notes, but I just want you to, this is a setup for what we're gonna do. When we talk about inorganic chemistry or inorganic compounds, this is the chemistry of substances that lack carbon and or hydrogen, okay? When I talk about organic chemistry and organic compounds, in organic, organic chemistry, this is the chemistry of substances that contain carbon and hydrogen, usually oxygen as well, okay? C is the chemical symbol for carbon, H is the chemical symbol for hydrogen, and O is the chemical symbol for oxygen. So, when we do or inorganic chemistry, that's chemistry of those molecules that aren't really part of a living organism's makeup. When I talk about organic chemistry, it gets its name from organisms, and these are the major building blocks of the, of the major components of a living organism. We are carbon-based life forms, and all life on Earth that we know of is carbon-based. All the major compounds in, um, in organic chemistry involve carbon and hydrogen. You have to have both, okay? So if I were to draw hydrogen gas, which is H2, that is not an organic molecule. And the reason it's not is because there's no carbon. If I have carbon dioxide, it is not considered a carbon, uh, 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 an organic molecule, because it's not, uh, it's because it's lacking hydrogen. But if I have um, something like glucose, C6, H12, O6, that's an organic compound because it has carbon and hydrogen. It's got oxygen as well. Or if I have just methane gas, CH4, that's an organic compound, okay? CH3OH, which is methanol, is an organic compound. Okay, CH4, or yeah, CH4ON2, which is uh, urea. That's an organic compound. It has carbon and hydrogen. It also has some nitrogen. 
So we can have other stuff mixed in, but if it has carbon and hydrogen, it's an organic compound. If it's lacking either carbon or hydrogen, it is not an organic compound. Water is inorganic. If I were to draw sodium chloride, table salt, that is inorganic. There's no carbon, no hydrogen. Potassium hydroxide, inorganic. There's no carbon. It has a hydrogen atom. It's got an OH group, which has a negative charge. It ionizes. But so organic chemistry is the chemistry of those substances that contain carbon and hydrogen. And they usually have oxygen, but not always. Inorganic chemistry is the chemistry of substances that lack carbon and or hydrogen. Okay. So now that we have that out of the way, oops, where'd my little eraser go? Give me a second. Um, now that we got that established, we're going to be talking about the four major organic compounds of the human body. So the four major organic compounds of the human body are four classes of substances. And when I say of the human body, I'm so used to teaching anatomy and physiology that I always say the human body. But all life forms on Earth that we know of, all living organisms, are made up of some combination of these four major organic compounds. <coughs> Excuse me. We're going to go over them in a specific order. So when we talk about these organic compounds, the first major class, so I'm going to write this on the board, four major classes of organic compounds that make up living organisms, the ones we're going to be talking about this semester. The first one is called carbohydrates. And if you look at the name, it tells you it has carbon and hydrogen in it. Another name for carbohydrates is that they are called poly. Poly is a word or a prefix that means many. Saccharide. Saccar means sugar. So it means the name tells you it's many sugars. A carbohydrate is a whole bunch of sugars clumped together. Another name for them is complex sugars. So when you hear someone talk about carbohydrates, polysaccharides, and or complex sugars, they're talking about all the same thing. They are made from Simple sugars. A simple sugar is also called a mono, meaning one, saccharide. So one of the simple sugars that we can look at is a substance called glucose. So if I have a little glucose molecule here all by itself, that's just a G with a circle around it representing a glucose molecule, which by the way, C6, oops, I didn't write that very well again. I keep doing that. It's C6H12O6. There's six carbons, 12 hydrogens, and six oxygens. By the way, there's another sugar. There's two more sugars. Called, one's called fructose, which is also C6H12O6. And there's another one called galactose, which is also C6H12O6. And the six is supposed to be a little subscript. Okay. These three simple sugars, glucose, fructose, and galactose, are made of the exact same number of carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens. They all have six carbons, 12 hydrogens, six oxygens. What makes one different from the other is the order and the arrangements, how they're all put together. Okay? So if I gave someone six green Legos, 12 red Legos, and six blue Legos, and I asked them to build something, if I gave another person the exact same set, and they built it, I might get two totally different things. They're made out of the same building blocks, but they're slightly different based on the order and the arrangement. So these three simple sugars can be put together sometimes, and I'm just gonna put an S here for sugar because depending on which sugar it is, I can make chemical bonds between these sugars and they can get all bound together sometimes in large chunks, in large chains or in little blocks that can be three-dimensional. And when I have a whole bunch of sugar molecules bound together like this, or sometimes the sugars are bound together in long chains and the chains can branch a little and have other sugars branching off. These would be carbohydrates. Many sugars all stuck together in covalent chemical bonds. 
So this is a complex sugar, this is a complex sugar, and each one of these can be made out of some of these monosaccharides, glucose, fructose, galactose, and there's a few other monosaccharides, but these are the major players in biology, okay? So when I talk about carbohydrates, I'm talking about large sugars called polysaccharides. Now, one of the things that we know is that all of the simple sugars are made out of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And when we talk about these polysaccharides, they only contain carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. So why are they important? I'm going to erase all of this. Well, there's, a, there's several ways that we can use polysaccharides in nature. The first way that we can use them is for energy. It turns out that if I take glucose, C6, H12, O6, plus six oxygen molecules, I run them through a series of chemical reactions with the proper enzymes plus mitochondria, and we'll talk about this later, I'm going to get 36 molecules of this stuff called ATP. This is the energy that our cells can use. We convert the energy in these chemical bonds into other chemical bonds that store it for usage. Kind of like we convert crude oil into energy, like gasoline, and then our cars can burn gas. We're converting this into that, and then our cells can burn it for energy. In addition to that, we get some carbon dioxide plus some water, okay? And the number of oxygens on both sides of this equation, I got six here, and I got 12 oxygens here. Well, I got 12 there and six there, six times that O, and whatnot. We can balance the equation, and you'll do that in chemistry. Well, all the simple sugars can be burned for energy. Now, here's what happens. Mother Nature can store sugars as carbohydrates. In a plant, we can refer to starch. Starch is a carbohydrate where we store sugars in plants. And in animals, we store it as a compound called glycogen. Now, when you eat, let's say you eat a whole bunch of sugars that are stuck together in a large molecule. After you eat them and you digest these sugars, your body will digest these sugars into individual subunits. And if I had a little six carbon uh, polysaccharide here, or six sugar polysaccharide, I will digest it into six monosaccharides. My cells, if I send that to a cell, the cell will burn some of the sugar and make ATP. The sugar enters the cell. I get a bunch of ATP out of it, and I'm going to get some waste. Now, let's say the amount of energy that my cells need for a given particular time is only going to utilize a so much of a sugar. And I keep taking big bites of this stuff, so every time I take a chunk of this stuff, I get six more sugars. And I eat a big chunk of something. I've eaten a whole bunch of french fries. I'm going to break down this, the, the carbohydrates that are in french fries, or potato, into simple sugars. My cells are going to use those sugars for energy. But if there's any leftover, My body does not want to waste the sugar. The sad truth is most people and most animals on earth have no idea where their next meal is coming from. So we are designed by nature that when we do get a little bit of food, if you've ever watched TV shows like Alone or Naked and Afraid, when people are starving, they are not getting sugar, they need enough energy to find the next meal. So we are designed to burn the amount of energy that we need to get to the next meal, and that's it. Any extra, you don't want to lose. You want to store it in case you have to go hours or days without eating. You don't run out of gas and die. And what happens is the leftovers get converted into glycogen in our body. Or any leftover sugar in a plant gets converted to starch. Although plants don't eat it, they photosynthesize it. We'll talk about that later. So one of the main ways that we utilize carbohydrates in nature, polysaccharides, 
is we digest them into simple sugars and we burn those simple sugars for energy. And any leftover, I can convert back into a starch and save it in my body. That way, if I don't get to eat for quite a few hours, I don't run out of gas, my body will digest its own starch and release the sugars. So it's kind of like a sugar savings. If I gave you $100 to go across the street to Whataburger, for those of you not in Texas or don't know, Whataburger is one of the best um, fast food chain hamburgers you could ever buy. Anyway, um, if I sent you across the street to buy some food and I gave you $100 and that meal was $7 and you have $93 left and I tell you I don't care what you do with the change, do you just leave it on the counter and give it to the store? Do you walk out and hand $93 to a homeless person? Do you give it to your friends? No. You go and you spend some of it. If you're smart, you might take some of it, maybe the extra $13 and put it in your wallet. Take the other 80 and you put it in the bank so that you can't spend it. Or you might have someone, hey, give me a 50. If I give you a $50 bill, how long are you gonna have that $50? Quite a long time because you go stop by a convenience store, how much is that? It's $1.50, ah, I don't wanna break a 50 for that. You pass by a munchie machine, ah, I don't wanna break a 50 for that. But if I give you $50 in ones, you start burning it like crazy. These are the ones, these are the big bills, and then we can stick it in our body in certain points as sort of a sugar bank. We call it the sugar bank in plants, starch. In animals, it's the glycogen. When we need it, if you run out of cash, you can go to your bank and pull some cash out to get you to the next stop. And if you get a little extra cash or have left over, you put it back in the bank. So we use sugars for energy. The extra sugars get stored as carbohydrates, as starch in plants, or as glycogen in animals. That's our number one use of polysaccharides or carbohydrates is for energy in the cell. Okay, And all of this will be in my notes, so if you have the notes sent, great. If you don't, you can um, purchase it from the bookstore. And um, if you're in my Canvas class, you can just download it. Um, another way that should carbohydrates can be used, a second use for carbohydrates is they can be used for structures. There are structural carbohydrates. Now, if you've had any biology before, you know that cells can have a lipid bilayer. And we can have lipids that look kind of like this in two layers that make up what we call the cell membrane. And I wrap these around in two rows, and I can put a nucleus and organelles or whatever in here. It turns out that our cells can also attach sugars in long chains or carbohydrates to some of the lipids here. And sometimes they're called a glycolipid. A glycolipid is a lipid with sugar attached to it. And so sometimes these help form structural components of the cell membrane. And in plants and animals, not only do they have a cell membrane, but, or not plants and animals, in plants and some other living organisms, a lot of the ones we're gonna talk about not only do they have a cell membrane, but they have a cell wall surrounding that membrane. And that cell wall can be made out of specific types of sugars sometimes, or have sugars in it that, that provide a lot of sturdiness and stiffness for that organism, okay? So, um, in plants, this cell wall is made out of a stuff called cellulose. It means the cell sugars, and the cellulose makes up the cell wall. Animal cells do not have a cell wall. We only have a cell membrane. But if a cell has a cell wall, it has a cell membrane, a lipid bilayer discussed in biology and anatomy classes, plus a cell wall made up of cellulose. And some organisms can have uh, a cell wall that's made out of chitin, and chitin will have some nitrogen, nitrogenous compounds mixed in, and we'll talk about that when, when the time is appropriate, okay? So, I want you to know this about sugars, okay, or about carbohydrates. They are also called polysaccharides or complex sugars. They are many monosaccharides clumped together. 
Our primary use for them is to digest them, to release the monosaccharides, the simple sugars, so we can burn them for energy. A second use is we can use them as structural components for cell walls and cell membranes. Okay? So, and I would know what cellulose is, and I would know um, a couple of the simple sugars that I mentioned. All right? Now, one of the things I want to show you, we're going to get into this in great detail eventually, but for what we call prokaryotes, well, we haven't even talked about what a prokaryote is. But a prokaryote is this, well, I'm not even going to talk about this right now. I'm going to bypass this. I have it in my notes, but when we get to prokaryotes and eukaryotes, we'll talk about how they convert things into energy. Okay? So now, um, the second major class of organic compounds. Okay, so we're done with carbohydrates for now. I'll talk about photosynthesis and all these other things with carbohydrates later. The second major class of organic compounds that we're going to talk about is going to be called lipids. In nature, lipids exist as fats, oils, and waxes. Beeswax, earwax, any waxes that are natural are lit made out of lipids. If it's an oil, like motor oil, canola oil, vegetable oils, it's a lipid. If it's fat, animal fat, bacon fat, it's, it's lipids. Lipids exist as fats, oils, and waxes. Okay? Um, a couple of things that I want you to know about them in addition. All lipids are made out of these atoms. They're made of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. But they are a different arrangement than sugars. How I put them together makes them a totally different class of compounds. And one major class of these is going to be called the triglycerides. We're going to talk about triglycerides in a little bit, or in, in later on in the semester. It has three glyceride molecules associated with it. And one of the things that's important about triglycerides is that they can be digested into fatty acids plus glycerol. Glycerol is essentially an alcohol form of a sugar. That's why it has the all at the end of the name. Fatty acids and glycerol can also be converted into energy. So one of the things that we could use lipids for is they're an alternate source of energy for our cells. So these two things right here are an alternate source of energy. And this is kind of the secret, by the way, behind a lot of these diets, these um, the keto diet and the Mediterranean diet and the South Beach diet and the Atkins diet is you cut out your consumption of sugar and your body will eventually burn fat for energy and then you lose all that fat um, and you go into ketosis and we'll talk about some of that chemistry later but conversely the opposite of that is if you over consume sugar not only will your body store the excess but when you run out of room you start converting the sugar into fat and it's sugars that's causing obesity. And we can convert sugar into fat just as easily as we can convert fat into sugar for energy. Okay? So one of, the, one of the functions of some lipids is they're an alternate source of energy. But primarily, what we use lipids for, the main source is they make the, they are used as the structural components, or they are the, the structural components of most biological membranes. So when we talk about the cell membrane, it's made out of lipids. When I talk about the nuclear membrane, it's got a lot of lipids in it. All the membrane-bound organelles, mitochondria, the Golgi apparatus, endoplasmic reticulum, they're made out of lipids, okay? So, <coughs> excuse me, two major functions for lipids. One, they are long-term energy storage. Um, we can store uh, some of these lipids and burn them for energy, particularly the triglycerides. But most importantly, they make up the structural components of most of the biological membranes. Cell membranes of all sorts of organisms are made out of lipids. Okay? The third major class of organic compounds. And by the way, you should know which atoms make up each one of these. Sugars, uh, 
Carbohydrates are made out of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Lipids are made out of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. It's just the arrangement and how they're put together, okay? The third major class of organic compounds that I want to talk about is proteins. Proteins are a big one, in my opinion, um, for a number of reasons. One thing we know about proteins is these tend to be the functional molecules of cells. What I mean by that is they perform most of the functions of a cell. What allows us to break down sugars to make ATP are enzymes, and enzymes are a certain class of protein. What allows us to convert sugar into fat are proteins. What's going to move an organelle sometimes from one side of the cell to the other in eukaryotic cells are called proteins. What's going to copy DNA into a new DNA strand is a protein. They're enzymes. What's going to turn DNA into RNA a lot of times is proteins, enzymes copying them. So proteins perform most of the functions of the cell. The atoms that make up our proteins, they're made out of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and they have nitrogen in them. The N stands for nitrogen. And two uh, of the amino acids have sulfur. I'm gonna put sulfur in a little parentheses here because sulfur is present in most proteins but not in amino acids. So now, know the atoms. Another thing that we can say about a protein is very often proteins can be referred to as polypeptides, which means many peptides, right? Well, a peptide is also something that we call an amino acid. So another way to define proteins is that they are long chains of amino acids. So if I take an amino acid and I bind it to another amino acid, I'm just putting the letters AA next to each other and circling them to represent an amino acid. If I build a long chain of amino acids like this, almost like beads on a necklace, then I have a protein, a polypeptide. Now, what makes one protein different from another is the order and the arrangements of the amino acids. And there's only 20 amino acids to choose from. All the proteins that we're going to talk about in nature are made out of the exact same 20 amino acids. What makes one protein different from another is the order and the arrangement of the amino acids. So let's say, and it doesn't really work this way, but let's say I have some amino acids that are going to be represented by these blue dots. And let's pretend that these amino acids are kind of like glass beads. And I have a giant bucket of thousands of black beads. I'm sorry, blue beads. I have another bucket of black beads. Thousands of them. Let's say there's 6,000 blue beads in one bucket, 6,000 blue beads in another bucket, and I have 20 buckets. Each bucket can only contain one type of amino acid, or one color bead, so to speak. Now, when I need to assemble a protein, what if someone gave me a piece of paper and on that piece of paper are some instructions that said, I need you to build this protein now and I need, this, need it built in this exact order. Or what if someone said, you work for a factory, a jewelry maker, and they say, hey, I need this piece of jewelry. I need a necklace and it's going to be 54 um, beads long and the beads must go exactly in this order. I need... For this particular piece of jewelry, I'm going to need two blue beads, and I'm just going to come up with some random colors, a black one, and then a brown one, and then so on and so forth. I'm not going to do all 54 colors and all 54 beads because we just don't have the time for that. But I just want to get this concept across to you. So then I have a couple of red beads, maybe three of them together, and then I have a purple bead. And then I have two black beads. Sometimes they can be repeated. Sometimes they're individual. And then I finish up with this. Okay. So this order of beads is one particular protein. Now let's say I get instructions to build a different protein. 
and it's this order. Just bear with me a second. I have a totally different protein. Which amino acids I used and exactly which order I put them in may make one different from the other. For example, I'm going to add one more amino acid on this protein. That protein has a pink amino acid. This one does not. This one happens to be so many amino acids long, this one is shorter. And the order and the arrangement. And if I made another set of beads that's exactly this long, but I change the order of the amino acids. Let's say I build a third protein. And I'm sorry this is taking so long, but bear with me. I'm really trying to get across what could be a very difficult concept, and I'm trying to explain it in a simple way. Now I have two proteins that have the exact same number of amino acids, but the order and the arrangement of the amino acids is different. These are different proteins. They're made out of the same 20 colors or the same 20 amino acids, but what makes one protein different from another is the order and the arrangements and the number of amino acids, okay? Our cells will build proteins using the fourth major organic compound called nucleotides, and we'll talk about that in a moment. So I'm going to erase a little bit of this information. Here's what I want you to know so far. Proteins are the functional molecules of cells. They're made out of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. A couple of them have sulfur. They are called polypeptides, or long chains of amino acids, because each amino acid is a peptide. And there's only 20 different amino acids of which all the proteins that we know of in nature are built from. What makes one protein different from another is the number and the order of the amino acids determines which protein is which, and that eventually determines the function of the protein, and we'll see how and why. You got it so far? Good. Now, let me erase all of this, and let me go on to the next thing I want you to know about proteins. And by the way, some of these markers really stick to this board, and the cleaning compounds that are used for these boards mess up some of the markers, and so I apologize if there's some ghosts on here during this lecture. I call them marker board ghosts because you can see the color in the background and whatnot. I'll see if this eraser will get rid of this. And it kind of does, but it's a lot of elbow grease. All right, you don't want to watch me erase. So now, I uh, want to make sure I'm not skipping anything that I want you to know. Oh, now, what really determines the function of a protein is not only the number and the order of, a range, uh, of the amino acids, but also what we call the 3D structure of a protein. So, this is going to be an important concept all semester. I'm not going to use different colors, but just pretend that these are all different amino acids. If I have a whole bunch of amino acids strung together, sometimes these proteins, and by the way, before I even go into this, you need to know this. All amino acids, at least the ones that are in our proteins, have a specific structure. So each individual amino acid is going to have what we call the main carbon or the central carbon. If you remember from our previous chemistry lecture, a carbon can form four covalent bonds with four other things. On one side, I'm going to have what's called an H2N group. I have two hydrogens and a nitrogen bound together. This is called an amino group in chemistry. Anytime you see amino, you think of nitrogen and hydrogen. Over here, I'm going to have a carbon that has two double bond, or has a double bond to an oxygen, and it has another oxygen and hydrogen here. And because this hydrogen can be can fall off very easily or dissociate when placed in solution, this part is called an acid. It happens to be called an, a carboxylic acid because this is called a carboxyl group in chemistry. We're not going to go all the way there yet. So now I have a carbon that has an amino on one side, an acid on the other, and then this can be called an R group 
and this could be called the R prime. The R group can vary. I could have a hydrogen and a hydrogen here, and I have a very simple amino acid. I can have a hydrogen and a methane group here, that's a more complex amino acid. And I can keep adding, these side groups can vary. This part never changes. All amino acids have an amino group, a main carbon, and an acid group. And then the side groups can vary, okay? So now, and by the way, how they bond is if I have another amino group over here, I'll have a hydrogen and a nitrogen, my carbon, my R prime, and my R, and another this, okay? One way they form a bond is this group, and one of these can be broken off and form water, and a chemical bond can be formed between the carbon and the nitrogen. That's called a peptide bond. And then another one can go here and another one there. And so amino acids get lined up from carbon to nitrogen, from carbon to nitrogen to carbon to nitrogen to carbon to nitrogen, and so on. That's not super important for you to know, but that's how two amino acids link together. What I want you to know is all amino acids have an amino group, a main carbon, an acid group, and two side groups. Now that was important because let's say these two amino acids here have a side group. I'm gonna make a much longer protein, okay? Give me just a second. Let me add some amino acids here. Let's say two different amino acids have some side groups that for some reason, if I put them close together, like to form a chemical bond. And two other amino acids might also have side groups that allow them to stick together. So what can happen is, since these things are floating around inside the cytosol like spaghetti boiling in a pot, if this protein were to bend a little bit and bring two amino acids close together, these two amino acids could form a chemical bond. So the protein can start to fold up. That might bring two other amino acids, maybe here and here, so the protein might twist a little bit, and then it can do this. It's forming multiple bonds. And eventually the protein can fold up into a unique three-dimensional shape, and it's because there are chemical bonds formed between different parts of the protein. The process is called protein folding. And this is called the natured form of the protein. That how it exists in nature when it's functioning. If I go back to this form, this is called the denatured form of a protein. The denatured form is the primary structure or straight amino acid. This is the natured form where it's folded up and functioning. And proteins fold based on how much the side groups of amino acids and certain amino acids like to bind together and get brought close together. And we talked a little bit about denaturing proteins when we talked about pH. Because every time I form a bond, I pull some water off with a hydrogen and a hydroxyl group. If I flood this protein with too much acid, some of those hydrogen ions are gonna force their way in here and cause the bond to break. And then the protein will naturally unfold. Therefore, it loses its function, okay? Now, the natured form, by the way, we also call the 3D form, the three-dimensional shape of the protein, okay? So now you need to know a lot about proteins. They're long chains of amino acids called polypeptides. What makes one protein different from another is the number and the order of the amino acids. There's only 20 amino acids. All amino acids are made out of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. Two of them have sulfur. Um, there's a main carbon that always has an amino group and an acid group on opposite sides, and then two side groups. And the side groups can allow a protein to fold under the right conditions. The folded form, the three-dimensional or natural form of the protein is called the natured form. When we unfold it to its straight line chain, it's called a denatured form. If a protein is denatured, it's non-functioning. It breaks down, it can't do its job, okay? Now I'm gonna erase this information. We're still not done with proteins. 
And I want to tell you a couple of last things. What do we use proteins for in our cells? Well, the main use of proteins is that they form the functional molecules. One class of proteins is called enzymes. Enzymes can be called biological catalysts. Oh my goodness, what does that mean? Well, a catalyst is any substance that increases the rate of a chemical reaction. Okay, what does that mean? So let's say I have substance A and substance B, and if I put them together in just the right conditions, they undergo a chemical reaction and they form substance C. And I can measure how much time it takes. The change in time, we call the delta T. Sometimes the capital T would be temperature. But I can measure the time. And let's say that time is, if I put these two substances in the universe or in a bucket close to each other, let's say after a while, after two weeks, I get substance C. The chemical reaction is very, very slow and takes a long time. Well, what if I take substance X? I don't know what X is, but when I mix it in this bucket, if I put X in here, the time goes from two weeks to 0 0.01 milliseconds, a hundredth of a millisecond, almost instantaneous. Boom, I get A and B to convert to C. And when I'm done, X is not used up in the chemical reaction. That would be called a catalyst. It sped up the rate of the reaction. It made the reaction happen faster. Another way to say it is they lower the activation energy. We're not going to talk about that. Well, if this was a biological catalyst and X was a protein, then we could say that X is an enzyme. Enzymes are proteins that act as biological catalysts. Any protein that acts as a biological catalyst that speeds up the rate of a biochemical reaction is called an enzyme. So a special class of proteins called enzymes can make chemical reactions in the living organism happen at a much more rapid rate. Two weeks might be too long for something to happen for life to continue. Life might need this chemical reaction to happen instantaneously. And our cells have the ability to make enzymes that speed up the chemical reactions of our body. Okay? That's one of the main functions of proteins is they can act as enzymes. Now I'm going to erase some of this. A lot of proteins can act as transport molecules. We call them transport proteins. If you studied any biology, you know that we can get substances to move across a cell membrane. For example, we know that there are proteins that act as little channels that allow substances to leak into and out of a cell. The concentration of sodium ions outside of a cell can be very high compared to the concentration of sodium ions inside the cell. Anytime I have those little squared off brackets, it means the concentration of whatever's inside of it. So this means a high concentration of sodium outside of our cell, a low concentration of sodium inside the cell. And since my concentration gradient looks like this for sodium, I can predict that if that little channel will let sodium pass through, sodium will move from outside to in. And as the sodium pours into the cell, if it reaches an equilibrium, everything stops moving. So sodium ions will move without any energy into a cell if we have a sodium ion channel. And that passive movement is called diffusion. Now, we also know that when we study the concentrations of potassium, the concentration of potassium is higher inside the cell than the concentration of potassium outside the cell. It's very low. If I have a potassium channel, potassium will leak out of the cell. There's inside. There's outside, and for my potassium concentration gradient, I can predict that potassium will leak out of the cell, and it does. 
These little ion channels are transport proteins. They're not really called transport proteins because transport proteins literally do transportation. They really, really move the molecule. But they're involved in cellular transport and they allow substances to diffuse into or out of the cell. And then we can have another protein called the sodium potassium pump. And what it will do is bind three of the sodiums that leaked in and kick them back out. And it can take two of the potassiums that got out of the cell and kick them back in. And every time it does that, it breaks down a molecule of ATP. That would be called active transport, moving substances against their concentration gradient. I, nature might require this imbalance. So they're going to leak, but I have to prevent the leaking. And the sodium potassium pump is constantly working against these. As sodium diffuses in, we pump it right back out, trying to keep the internal or the intracellular concentration of sodium relatively constant. As potassium leaks out, we can kick it right back in. This is a transport protein. It happens to be called the sodium potassium ATPase or sodium potassium pump. So proteins can act as transport molecules or transporters. They can move substances or allow substances to move into and or out of the cell. You should know what osmosis and diffusion are. You should also know what facilitated diffusion is and you should know what active transport is. Um, from either your anatomy and physiology class or your chemistry class. So please review those concepts, okay? Um, let's see. We're going to talk about some other proteins and enzymes. One last thing, I, well, we'll get into some more chemistry later on. I'm going to try to keep it simple because we could go on and on and on about this stuff. All right, so now, those are some major important proteins inside the cell. The last of the four major organic compounds that I want to talk about is called nucleic acids. Just looking at the name, we know something about them. They have a pH less than 7. They are acidic. Nucleic acids can also be called polynucleotides, which means many nucleotides bound together. And they really bind together in these long chains. So nucleic acids are usually polynucleotides or many nucleotide molecules bound together into these long chains. All nucleotides are composed of three other things. One is called a five carbon sugar. The second one, let me rewrite the word sugar, that didn't come out very well. These sugars have only five carbons instead of six, like the other sugars we saw before. The second thing they're made out of is called a phosphate group. A phosphate group has an atom of what we call phosphorus and four oxygens stuck to it with a negative charge. And finally, the last thing, it's also called phosphoric acid. There would be a hydrogen, but it will dissociate. That's what gives it its acidity. And the last thing that we find on them is called a nitrogenous base. A base is something that has a basic pH, and this one has nitrogen on it. Now, all nucleotides are made out of a five carbon sugar, a phosphate group, and a nitrogenous base. Now I'm gonna erase this part right here. I wanna leave that, this part down below, and I want you to see something. There are two major nucleic acids in the human body, okay? Or in all or living organisms that we're gonna talk about. Bacteria, viruses, whatever. They can be DNA, and they can be RNA. DNA is called deoxyribonucleic acid, DNA. Deoxyribonucleic acid. RNA stands for ribonucleic 
acid. There's the R, there's the N, there's the A. Okay. Now there's a difference between DNA and RNA. I'm going to erase what we wrote out here. One of the differences, by the way, is they both have a sugar in them called ribose, but this, one, this one's ribose is missing an oxygen, so we call it deoxyribonucleic acid. You can look up the spelling of those two terms, and you should know them. When it comes to DNA, the five carbon sugar found in DNA is called deoxyribose. The five carbon sugar found in RNA is called ribose. You should know that. The phosphate group in both of them is the PO4 minus. It doesn't change. It's the same phosphate in ATP, adenosine triphosphate. The ditrogenous base, there are four to choose from. They're called adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. In DNA, I have these four nitrogenous bases to choose from. Adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. And I apologize for the poor penmanship. I'm trying to write a little bit nicer. In RNA, there are four of these to choose from. And by the way, adenine is abbreviated as an A, thymine is abbreviated as a T, guanine is abbreviated as a C, and cytosine is as a G, and cytosine is abbreviated as a C. This is the A, T's, G's, and C's that you see in DNA and RNA. The only difference is, I should say DNA, the only difference is we have adenine, we have guanine, and we have cytosine. We have three of the same nitrogenous bases. The only difference is in RNA, we have a substance called uracil. It's a different base. We do not find any thiamine in RNA. We do not find any uracil in DNA. So if I'm looking at a nucleic acid, and I see that the sugar in it is ribose, and one of the bases that's present in the long chain is uracil, and there's no thymines, I must be looking at RNA. If I look at a nucleic acid, and I see deoxyribose, and I see thymines, and no uracils, it must be DNA. Now those are two simple differences between the two that I want you to know at this point. All nucleic acids are long chains of nucleotides. All nucleotides are made out of these three things, a five carbon sugar, a phosphate group, and a nitrogenous base. The, nucle the nucleotides in DNA are made out of deoxyribose, phosphate, and then one of these four bases, and I can have four different nucleotides in DNA. What makes one nucleotide different from the other is which one of the bases is present. In RNA, all nucleotides will have ribose, phosphate, and then one of these four bases. The same adenine, guanine, and cytosine as DNA, but there's no thymine in RNA, there's only uracil. Okay? Now, um, we're going to talk about DNA and RNA in much more detail later on when we get to some of the genetics of microbes. So for now, I'm going to stop with the four major organic compounds. We've already talked about water. We've talked about all of these other uh, um, chemistry concepts. Um, I've tried to keep it really simple so that it's easy to understand for now. Later on, we're going to revisit some of these concepts, and we're going to utilize that information to have a deeper understanding of what is the genome, the nucleic acids found in bacteria and viruses and other organisms, um, and how they, do, how they copy their DNA and how we can manipulate them using enzymes and other things how, uh, to, to recombine DNA and do what we call genetic engineering. Another thing that's going to happen is when we look at the cell membranes and the cell walls, those carbohydrates and those proteins that can make up some of the cell walls of some of these organisms, um, we're going to see what makes one bacterium different and why some bacteria make you sick and why some don't. It's the composition of their cell wall very often. That's not the only reason. Okay. All right. So we're going to conclude our chemistry lecture for now. I think I don't want to talk anything else. I've talked a little bit about proteoglycans and glycoproteins. 
when we went in the first series of videos and we were talking about um, bacteria and we were talking about uh, archaea and certain uh, fungi, we talked about what was in their cell walls, peptidoglycans, proteoglycans, cellulose, and whatnot. You need to know that information, and we're going to combine peptides and sugars and, um, and other things later on to understand what the outer coating of some of these cells that we're going to talk about in microbiology are. We're also going to spend a lot of time on their DNA. I do apologize about the poor penmanship. I hope you can read what I'm writing, but most of this information will also be in my notes. Listen, I hope you learned something. I hope you had as much fun as I did, and I'll see you in the next lecture. Thanks for watching.